Hey guys, welcome to the Biomechanics 2 video series. Um, seeing that we're still stuck with no lectures at this point in time, I kind of figured I'd make a brief overview of a couple of the lectures that are still outstanding so that you guys can at least go through it and um, hear my soothing voice as we go through these lectures. Okay, so this one's looking at the mechanical principles uh, applied to the human body, specifically looking at the kinematics, so we'll unpack that a little bit more. Um, and in a second video, we'll look at kinetics and kinematic, uh, I guess, applied calculations, because something that we want to do a little bit later on is try and determine the average muscular forces involved in different types of scenarios. Okay. Um, so part of uh, kinetics and kinematics, um, specifically kinematics, that is involved is looking at the application of statics and dynamics. So, statics is concerned with bodies at rest or constant velocities. There's no acceleration that tends to happen. Um, there's an equilibrium type of a situation. So, often here we have uh, equilibrium. It's, it's really useful for early phases of rehabilitation. So, in these types of scenarios, what we have are isometric uh, contractions, right? Isometrically, if you guys remember, is when we have contraction without uh, lengthening or shortening of a muscle. And examples in terms of exercises that are really applicable for that would be, for example, your, uh, your front plank. Um, things like pull-up holds, um, where, for example, uh, a person might have an injury to the ulnar collateral ligament. So a pull-up hold is a really good way to start strengthening muscles in and around the elbow joint but without causing any kind of shortening or lengthening of muscles around that joint specifically. Um, also if you think about maybe hip or knee pain, um, so where the person is kind of standing next to a uh, wall of some sort and with their leg they're pushing against the wall over here. So that would cause the muscles around the hip and the knee to start contracting but they're not lengthening or shortening, right? So it's an isometric contraction that's really, really important there. Um, once you've progressed through that phase, uh, you typically go towards dynamics. Uh, and then the dynamics is where bodies are accelerating or decelerating. So it's more applicable to your final phases of rehabilitation. So in these scenarios uh, is where you start looking at isotonic types of contractions. You're looking at... Um, isokinetic and you're also looking at specifically uh, eccentric loading okay so once the person is ready to return to high levels of sporting performance um, you're trying to make the exercise as sport specific as possible which means you're not just lifting weights or in the gym and trying to go through the motions you're trying to make it as specific as possible and as applicable as possible to make sure that when the person returns to sport um, they can do so safely. All right, so that means that there's a clinical application in terms of the purpose of biomechanics. So some of the things that you would want to get, bet get a better appreciation of is uh, the forces acting on the human body in different types of scenarios. You also want to know how to manipulate these forces uh, in order to better understand ways in which you can either increase or decrease a force uh, in order to serve your purpose. Right, so when you are rehabilitating, you want to often reduce the forces. And if you're wanting to improve performance, you may want to tweak specific muscle groups. So a, a quick um, example is, say, for example, you're doing something like a squat. Right. So under a normal squat situation, uh, where your center of gravity provides a downward force, um, Part of what you're interested in is the lever arm length between the force, for example, and hip. So looking at lever arm over here, or you're looking at the lever arm between the knee uh, and the force um, of, of body weight or if you're doing something with exercises. Um, so this over here is for knee and this over here is for hip. However, this a center of mass force tends to shift forward or backwards will lengthen or shorten these respective lever arms. So when it moves backwards, it moves, moves closer to the hip, meaning there's less force around the hip, but it moves further from the knee, meaning greater forces around the knee. Conversely, if I move this forward, 
So if I bend forward a lot more, say for example if I was doing a front squat or goblet squat, uh, the weight force moves closer to the knee and further from the hip, and therefore there's less force around the knee, greater force around the hip joint. Okay, so I can tweak exercises depending on what it is that I need to do, but it's how to manipulate them that becomes really important. Okay, so we can see and feel postures and motions, but we seldom see the forces acting on it. And the only way that we can sometimes understand it is by understanding the mechanics behind the movement. All right, so kinematic specifically is a branch of biomechanics concerned with describing motion of bodies without references to forces or mass. Okay, so it's how far, fast, and consistently a body moves. So it may uh, entail movements uh, such as a single single point, such as the center of gravity, or position of several segments, such as upper arms, lower arm, uh, uh, low extremities in terms of your thigh or your leg or your foot and ankle. Okay, so that um, is similar to what you guys did in your kinematic analysis um, of the standing broad jump. Right, you looked at ranges of motion of uh, the shoulder and of the hip and of the knee and what its contributions were to how far and how high a person jumped. Okay, so that's exactly the, the the kind of crux behind kinematics, right? We often use it uh, in quite a bit of detail. You guys got some um, introduction to it in terms of a two-dimensional analysis. So obviously we have the capacity to do more complicated analyses uh, in three dimensions. So that allows us to really get detailed insights and overviews into how movements are initiated, how we can improve movements and how we can facilitate uh, both the process of rehabilitation as well as improving um, higher levels of performance. Okay, so part of what the kinematic analysis entails is the study of osteokinematics and orthokinematics, where osteo is concerned with bones and arthro is kinematics is concerned with uh, joints specifically. So that means we have to have an understanding of the planes of motion um, and as we know there are three specific planes that we uh, tend to study movement in. So that's these three planes over here. Frontal, sagittal and transverse plane. So I've just unpacked it a little bit more in terms of the accessory motions that happen. So in the frontal plane um, that in essence just meaning we're looking at the person literally uh, face on. The motions that you can assess and analyze there are primarily adduction and abduction. Okay. The other things that you can see, so say for example you are looking at the person from the front, uh, let's say here's their shoulders uh, and there's their arms. Uh, motions that you can track is movement both uh, superiorly and inferiorly. Right. So, for example, if their hips lift up, uh, if the hips lift up or the shoulders move up or down or whatever the case may be, those are motions that you can see in the frontal plane quite clearly as well. In the sagittal plane, so looking on side on, that's what you guys did in your jumping analysis. Uh, lots of motion that happens there, specifically for hips and knees. Uh, it's flexion and extension, right? That's that's motions that you guys assessed in, in quite a bit of detail. But again, in the um, in the sagittal plane, so looking at it from the side, um, if this was the person just side on, what you can also see is posterior and anterior movements. Okay, So as a person, for example, moves the shoulders forward or backwards or the hips forwards and backwards. So you can see those types of uh, motions too. And then finally, the transverse plane, probably the most complicated one to assess and analyze. That's where you need 3D analyses in order to get any idea of what's happening transversely. And those you see internal external rotations um, and again you could see uh, posterior or anterior movement so say for example I was looking um, at a person from the top and here's their um, here's their shoulder uh, let's make it a little bit big, bigger so here's their shoulders so again in the transverse plane um, if this is the way that they're looking you could track uh, anterior or posterior motions of, of specific joints or specific segments. Okay, So not only are the physiologic motions important, the accessory motions are just as important. Right? It creates something that we'll refer to a little bit later on as degrees of freedom. If we understand or try and understand why there's a huge amount of variation in how someone kicks or throws something, it comes down to how the joints are structured and these physiologic and accessory motions that they can uh, initiate.
So how do we start measuring uh, these ranges of motion of specific segments? So one branch is called goniometry. There's different ways in which which we can measure it, but one of them is the application of a coordinate system, right? So that we can measure the degrees of motion present uh, in specific joints. And, and we have uh, means and methods of assessing it for every single joint uh, or, or close to every single joint in the body. Okay, so you can see what a goniometer looks like. It's basically like an enlarged protractor. Um, so very similar to a protractor in the form that it measures specific angles. So you have a fulcrum over here uh, that you will typically try and align with a specific axis. So on the joint line itself, you have uh, this over here, which is called a stationary arm. And then you have this over here, which is your mobile arm. Okay, so you'd basically align these um, at specific joint locations and try and measure uh, the range of motion that can occur in that specific joint. So whether it's flexion and extension or rotation or lateral movements, uh, there's a specific way in which you would need to set it up for a specific joint. Okay. Quite interesting, you can also use something that's called an uh, inclinometer. Um, most of your smartphones will be able to get access to an app that basically allows you to measure the incline of something, uh, which also has applications for joint range of motion measurements. Okay, but I'll show you guys that uh, another time. All right. So measurements are typically made from anatomical zero. Um, so your anatomical zero position is literally the zero degree mark and then all measurements are measured relative to that. So say for example, I had a person uh, standing side on and I'm interested in measuring um, hip motion. So if hip motion is the angle between the trunk and the thigh, I'm interested in this, uh, this angle over here that's taken as zero so then as the person moves into hip flexion um, so they're lifting their leg up this is the um, this is the shin and this over here is the thigh then I'm interested in that angle uh, over there so how much it's moved from the starting position to that position um, so hang on, uh, it's not this angle over here, it's this angle over here. Okay, this is the angle of interest. That's the one I'm measuring. How much did it move from the starting position to this upward position? And then it depends, there's, there's norms um, for your different joints. So if you take the hip, for example, um, you'll have approximately 140 to 150 uh, degrees of flexion. Uh, I might also be interested in terms of how much I can, how much extension I can get. So relative to the starting position, this will be my angle of interest and saying how far back can I possibly go. Um, and there you'll have, again, norms for hip extension. And the same is true for shoulder flexion extension and internal and external rotation, etc., etc., etc. So there's a couple of variables that tend to affect how flexible you are. Um, gender is one of them. So we know, for example, that um, females typically have greater flexibility or greater range of motion ability than males. Not always true, but on the average, that tends to be true. Um, sorry, that's talking about age. I was talking about gender. <laughs> um, skipping ahead here. Uh, so gender in terms of males and females, age, the older you get, the more your range of motion tends to decrease unless you maintain it. Uh, body build, so mesomorphy, endomorphy, ectomorphy, um, and the type of anatomical structures that you have. So just because you're big bone doesn't mean you're inflexible. Um, the type of motion that you um, are measuring, whether it's active or passive. So some people might actually be very flexible, but they have limited active range of motion. But when you measure it passively, um, they can assess, in essence, do the splits, but they can't do it actively, right? Uh, so that's 
that's quite interesting sometimes there in terms of measuring both active and passive ranges of motion. Okay, uh, we can also use, uh, in essence, digital goniometers. So, for example, here we were doing some video analysis uh, of a person running, and we were trying to see what the knee angle is at midfoot, um, or at heel strike, basically, transitioning into midfoot. So what was the knee angle at that point in time? And then we correlate that with w from a, a frontal view to see how the knee tends to deviate medially or laterally at that same instant in time, right? So uh, things like your dynamic um, Q angles um, would be of, of significant interest because that's going to tell us um, things like risk for uh, knee pain, for example, or hip pain or whatever the associated abnormalities may be. Good. Uh, normal individual range of motion can also vary with bony structure, uh, muscular development, body fat, ligamentous integrity. Uh, again, we've mentioned gender, whether that individual tends to be male or female, uh, and age, right? So a really good test for flexibility of multiple joints tends to be your overhead squat. In this case, the person is using dumbbells. That's even better than using a bar. Um, because it really gives you an insight into the person's um, mobility restrictions and limitations in that pos uh, specific posture. Quite interesting, like I was saying, muscular development. Um, people often say, well, you know, I gym a lot, so my muscles are big and therefore I'm less flexible. Um, quite interestingly, uh, Olympic weightlifters, who are probably the most powerful athletes uh, in terms of their strength to weight ratios and lifting a heavy object above the head, are the second most flexible population group of athletes next to gymnasts, right? So gymnasts are obviously most flexible. They've spent lots and lots of time practicing flexibility, and so do Olympic weightlifters, okay? Um, flexibility in terms of hip, knee, ankle, shoulder, and wrist range of motion is incredibly, incredibly important under those high loads. So, I mean, if you're balancing something like 200 kilograms in an overhead position and you lack mobility, that's an injury waiting to happen. Uh, over here, you also see a bodybuilder. I kind of just figured that the complete opposite end of the extreme is probably the most hypertrophied individuals, which are your bodybuilders. Uh, and you note here that this person is quite capable of doing the splits. But again, that doesn't just happen um, through magic, right? It is a trained skill. So flexibility is really, really important in all senses, but it is something that you have to train. So when you're measuring flexibility, there's different kinds of end fields. Right, so as you're moving a joint through its full range of motion, um, how do you know when to stop? You know, One is, yes, the person will tell you when to stop, but... What does that range of motion end feel tell you about the factor that is limiting the range of motion? So when there's a hard end feel, it typically means that there's bone to bone contact. Um, so that's what this uh, BB stands for here, bone to bone contact. So for example, your elbow joint, when you lock it out, uh, that's quite a hard end feel, which means basically your olecranon um, is making contact with your humerus, right? It's being stopped by bone to bone contact. Firm springy feels often is ligamentous, capsular or muscular. So say for example, you're measuring your wrist. Um, when you take your wrist into complete flexion and you provide some overpressure, you can feel that springiness in that wrist. Um, so that means it's a, it's a ligamentous and capsular restriction. And remember, um, tenderness attachments pass through the wrist, which give you the muscular component to that as well. Um, but that end feel is firm and springy and when it's soft it means contact of adjacent soft tissues might be limiting it so for example when you do forearm flexion uh, your forearm makes contact with your bicep and that might be limiting range of motion it's just a, a soft end feel um, so it's normally your soft tissue structures that might be limiting the range there okay so again like um, I mentioned previously there will be normative ranges for each of your joints uh, and being able to measure them is going to be a critical aspect because it does give you a lot of insight into what might be limiting that person, both functionally um, from a performance point of view um, or from an injury point of view. If an athlete was injured, it might have been due to restricted motion uh, 
you often see that happening in rugby players, for example, um, where you might have a groin strain or a hamstring strain due to limited range of motion in that specific area. Um, same thing if you look at cricket players. Uh, so cricket players, when they deliver a ball, for example, uh, if this was the front on view, uh, the person's running in and you have these sidearm bowlers, sometimes what might be r uh, limiting that or causing the sidearm action is a restriction of muscles in and around the shoulder joint. Uh, oftentimes, uh, cricketers have this really straight arm action where the ball's coming overhead and you have these other guys that tend to sling it around the side, but part of that might be um, structural aspects uh, around the, the shoulder joint. So digging deeper gives you a, a lot of insight. Uh, rotatory and translatory motion is also affected by the shape and congruency of the actual joint itself. Remember by definition, rotation is when movement occurs around an axis or pivot point and all the aspects tend to travel through the same angle and the same direction at the same time. In terms of translation is when a body moves so that all part of the body tend to travel the exact same distance in the same direction in the same time but without rotation okay so say for example um, you have a person and I'm just going to kind of draw a bicycle over here uh, with really weird wheels uh, and over here's the seat and the person's kind of sitting on that and pedaling around um, the joints will be moving through rotation right they're kind of just pedaling around pedaling around but the entire body is also moving forward. So it's a combination of translation and rotation. Even when you're walking, that's uh, it's the same example. It might have actually been easier to draw. But anyways, um, so for the human body, there's always a combination of translation and rotation. And it's the forces governing that that we're interested in studying and, and trying to understand. Okay, so I've covered that. Um, degrees of freedom is a concept that allows us to understand how variations in movement are possible, right? So how one person throws is different for how another person throws or the requirements for a discus throw and a shot put throw are different to that for a javelin throw or a baseball throw, right? So there's huge amounts of variability and being able to understand the different motions that are possible in different joints does give us an insight into why that variation is so large. So for example, a joint that moves in one plane typically only experiences or has one axis of rotation, which means then it has one degree of freedom. Your elbow joint is a perfect example of that, right? You typically have only flexion and extension. There's one axis of rotation giving it one degree of freedom. A joint that moves in two planes, however, has two axes of rotations and therefore two degrees of freedom. So your metacarpal phalangeal joint or your finger joint um, for your knuckles, uh, your radiocarpal joints in terms of the wrist um, permit flexion and extension uh, in the sagittal plane but also adduction and abduction in the frontal plane right so there's two degrees of freedom that occur within those specific joints ball and socket joints have flexion extension adduction abduction and rotation both internal and external giving it three degrees of freedom because it moves in three planes Okay, so your hip joint and your shoulder joint are perfect examples of, of that. Um, but it does mean that as you transition from something like your trunk all the way down to your finger, if you're looking at throwing actions, you have something like 19 degrees of freedom because it's a summative effect, right? So you couple the motion from the trunk, the motion from the shoulder, the motion from the elbow, the motion from the wrist, and the motion possible in each of your fingers um, can give um, additive degrees of freedom, which means you have, in essence, something like 19 degrees of freedom or 19 different possible combinations in terms of how the arm um, as a whole can move during the requirements of a throwing action. So that is quite... Uh, substantial am amount and you can see that here um, in this thorax to finger example um, 19 degrees of freedom like I was talking about there okay so it's a combination of several joints uniting in successive segments to allow for greater variation and movement capacity in your lower extremity so for example from trunk to your toe there's even more 25 degrees of freedom because there's a lot more um, there's a lot more joints 
in that specific segment which allows for greater variation okay so if you look at how your foot can adapt and adjust to different surfaces when you're running and walking uh, and you can do that quite comfortably you don't tend to trip or stumble or fall all the time so it means that there's a good uh, base of support for the planted foot and lots of um, additive motions that allow for much smoother transition of motion all right it also brings us to the concept of open and closed kinematic chains so you guys should be familiar with these definitions an open kinematic chain is one where the distal segment is free to move in space and the segments can move independently or not at all so throwing and kipping, uh, kicking are typical examples of that as are leg extensions or bicycles for example right you are trying to isolate a specific joint and it doesn't require movements of any other joints for that specific movement to occur right so for example if i'm doing leg extension that basically entails movement of the knee joint i don't have to have movement in the ankle or hip joints in order to initiate that movement right same thing with throwing um, and like i said kicking closed kinematic chain however are different uh, a segment is typically fixed so that other parts are required to move so say for example i was doing a push-up a pull-up or even the simple act of walking um, movement of one joint will affect successive movements in the other joints so if I'm trying to do a push-up, bending of the elbow requires bending of the shoulder and wrist in order for me to successfully complete a push-up. Same thing is true with a pull-up, right? Even though wrist is not necessarily required to flex or extend, movement of the elbow requires movement of the shoulder. It's therefore not an isolated movement. It's a compound movement. Multiple joints are involved. With multiple joints, I bring in multiple muscles as well. Um, <coughs> there can be a combination of... Uh, open and closed kinematic chains in the same movement so say for example again walking so while the foot is planted on the ground that would be an example of a closed kinematic chain because movement of one joint requires movement of the other joints I have hip knee and ankle motion during that specific phase um, however the swing leg is in the air that might require only something like uh, hip movement um, it allows me to compensate say for example when my leg or my hip is injured I can isolate movement at specific joints during the swing phase not so much during the stance phase okay so there's various examples that we could bring into play with that so for clinical application purposes um, multiple degrees of freedom permit a wide selection of movement patterns right so uh, if I am injured at one specific joint uh, I can compensate with that and let my other joints take up some of the slack okay so again goniometric measurements allow us to kind of almost preempt the potential for injury so if I realize there are restricted motions there's a couple of things that I want to start doing in terms of digging deeper I want to find out why is that motion restricted what is causing the restriction and how can I improve it because often when I have restricted motion, it means something was wrong that caused that restriction in the first place or there's some kind of compensation going on or the fact that over time this restriction is going to cause injuries up and down the kinetic chain. So that's something I don't obviously want to see. Uh, pathological limitations such as pain, swelling or soft tissue shortening can also restrict normal functioning. Uh, and again, we can pick that up through goniometric measurements and dynamic measurements. Um, some joints however it's a little bit harder to pick up because of the large number of degrees of freedom so a limit in one degree of freedom is masked by compensatory mechanisms in the other joints um, making up the multiple degrees of freedom so for example a stiff knee can be overcome through compensation in the hip ankle and back uh, even in the opposite extremity so we often find that right so one side is injured and over time the other side ends up being injured due to these compensatory mechanisms. So there's a price paid for compensation. Not only do you have increased energy expenditure for the same movement speed, but prolonged compensation can result in repetitive microtrauma as well as dysfunction and compensa compensation in other joint structures. Um, further impairments can decrease motions um, in terms of functioning or your functional ability and over time it can be disabling right so a loss of one degree of freedom in the finger of a cricket player or pianist might have far-reaching consequences right they are very specialized movement patterns uh, in those joints um arthrokinematics i think this is kind of like the semi-last section 
uh, is specific to joint surfaces themselves. So joints are really, really interesting, right? Um, they are way superior to anything that's man-made. Uh, if you think about the average lifespan of a joint, it can be anywhere between 70 to 100 years, depending on, I guess, how long you live. And part of the reason that they tend to function so well is they have an extremely low coefficient of friction. So if you guys remember, um, the coefficient of friction basically tells us how much resistance there is to movement. And in a human joint, um, it can be as low as 0 0.01 to 0 0.003 um, in terms of the actual coefficient of friction. So it's almost entirely frictionless due to the synovial fluid and the lubrication within that joint. Uh, it also has a presence of sensation and proprioceptive feedback, so you always know where your joint is in space. Right, you can do that whole finger touch test. So if you um, have both your index fingers in front of you uh, and they're about shoulder width apart, close your eyes and try and touch uh, your finger, the tips of your fingers together. Uh, and most of you guys can do that quite easily, meaning there must be some kind of feedback mechanism between the joint and the brain itself telling you where it is in space. It's also really important for balance. So each of your major joints, specifically the weight-bearing joints like your knee, ankle, and hip, um, have specific mechanoreceptors that facilitate proprioceptive feedback um, and allow you to balance and adapt to uneven surfaces, right? So again, you can test that by balancing on one leg, um, trying to close your eyes and hold it for 30 seconds without shaking. If you can do that quite comfortably, your proprioceptive system is quite uh, well intact. Uh, if you can't, it means that there's some work to be done. Uh, it also has a dynamic growth response to wear and tear. So the more you tend to use a joint, uh, that joint tends to reinforce in areas of high use. Um, it's quite interesting. I mean, back in the day, they could tell um, once they dug up the skeletons of past Olympic warriors. Uh, I'm talking about like ancient times, Greek times. Uh, they could tell what sport that person specialized in, right? So if there's significant wear and tear of the shoulder joint, that person was definitely a thrower or some kind of person that did a lot of sparring, use of weapons uh, such as swords or javelins or spears, um, require lots of shoulder movement, lots of wear and tear, and there's reinforcement of those specific joints there. Um, Wolf's Law tends to tell us quite a bit about that. So um, it's spelled something like that. Wolf's Law, uh, meaning that there's a dynamic growth response. Bones for example, tend to thicken um, in response to use, right? So thickened bones um, when they are loaded. So again, that has applications for as you age. Um, if you can do some kind of resisted training, um, it places greater um, force requirements on the muscles. Muscles tend to pull on bones and as a response to that increased pull and increased force generation requirement, uh, the bones tend to thicken, right? So for things like uh, osteoporosis where your bones tend to degenerate with time, um, by engaging in resisted activities, you, you can't reverse osteoporosis, but you can slow the rate at which it tends to progress, okay? Um, and there's various mechanical complexities in human bones that facilitate its longevity. Um, you have different types of uh, joint structures. So ovoid and secular or cellar joints are, are the ones that we are interested in. Ovoid uh, are basically convex. So if you think about your shoulder and your hip joint, these allow for a large range of motion. Um, they have greater economy in terms of the articular surface area, greater area per your unit volume and a reduction in the size of the joints um, itself right so if you think about your shoulder joint it allows for a huge amount of range of motion but it's a very very small joint so there are some instability issues that might um, result from that um, but it's a, it's a price paid for that increased range of motion that we can experience there so there's three types of motion when it comes to joints um, in order to facilitate the motion that you can experience. There is some rolling and rocking. So for example, if you had to take the knee, if the knee were just to rotate, uh, in essence, it would fall off. So it would rot, um, if I just kind of had to redraw this over here, um, it would almost just kind of roll off. So in order to prevent that, it has to slide 
backwards, right? Um, so there's some sliding and gliding as well as some spinning that tends to happen. Um, so all of these three have to, in combination, um, work together in order to facilitate the range of motion that tends to happen within a specific surface area, right? So that brings into play um, the fact of how are joints able to maintain stability even though they are able of um, this increased range of motion, right? So like we mentioned, the shoulder joint, which is your glenohumeral joint, um, if I kind of just had to draw uh, the shoulder blade over here, and then you have your uh, glenoid cavity over here, and then you have your humerus, um, let's say this person was kind of just doing a side raise, it's a very, very shallow joint, um, but there's lots of muscles, right? Remember your sits muscles, uh, you've got your uh, global muscles such as your trapezius, your deltoid, uh, your lats, your pecs, etc., 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 that all tend to reinforce it. You've also got various glenohumeral ligaments uh, that tend to surround it. You've got a joint capsule that tends to surround it, and all of those tend to reinforce it. Um, so there are various positions that you can put the joint in that facilitate stability, and there's various positions that you can put the joint in that facilitate range of motion. So if you think about uh, something like where there's high load, such as a one-handed handstand, or whenever uh, gymnasts are on the rings, that's high load. And in this position, how do you increase stability? So what you can see here is there's a huge amount of external rotation, external humeral rotation in the shoulder, and that tends to facilitate stability. It's creating a, a closed, packed position in that specific joint. So it's not, don't get confused with open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain. Closed, packed position refers to um, the surface of the joint itself. In a closed, packed position, there's maximum joint surface contact that occurs, right? The attachment of ligaments are furthest apart and therefore under tension. So when I'm externally rotating as this gymnast is over here, um, what that tends to do is it tends to twist the ligaments um, that are surrounding this partic particular joint and therefore uh, decrease the distance that they are apart and therefore make them tight and therefore it allows for a more taut or tight capsular structure, which tends to reinforce it, right? The joint is mechanically compressed and difficult to s distract or separate. Uh, it's exactly what you want in this position or in this position over here. In other positions, however, you want to increase the mobility of the joint, right? So that's referred to as an open packed position. Remember, it's not open kinetic chain, it's an open packed position or a loose packed position. Here, ligaments are further apart more slack, uh, joint surfaces are distracted several s uh, millimeters, they're not compressed, uh, it allows for motions of spin roll and glide to take place and therefore decreases joint friction, right? It allows greater mobility in the joint. All right, so be able to differentiate between those, that's quite important. Um, think about it in terms of your knuckle joints uh, and your finger joints. So, a fist, right? where your metacarpal phalangeal joint is at 90 degrees, prevents abduction or separation of your fingers um, so that all the force can be put into finger flexion, right? So the fact that you bending your fingers whenever you are carrying a bag actually facilitates your ability to carry that bag. It requires little muscular force because the joint's already reinforced um, by the ligaments and tendons surrounding that joint. Okay. Um, so when you have a fist, it's very difficult to pull your fingers apart. And when your fingers are open, it's more in a loose pack position and you have greater mobility and range. Standing also causes the hips and knees to be in a closed pack position. It allows you to stand for several hours, right? Requiring very little muscular force. Um, most of you, if you guys stand for hours, will experience some lower back pain, but that means that there's an abnormality. There's, there's muscles that are tight around your hip and lower back area. It's the only reason that you're feeling lower back pain. Uh, otherwise, it's it's a very low impact impact activity, and you should be able to do it quite comfortably for a couple of hours with very very little to no muscular activity.
Uh, additional movements such as flexion and extension um, require the joint surfaces to be moved several millimeters. Um, and these are, remember, termed accessory motions. So a distraction of the metacarpal phalangeal joints would be an example of that. Oftentimes in rehabilitation um, or in motions where we, where, whereby we try and increase flexibility in a joint, we try and use accessory motions in order to facilitate that, right? We use elastic bands to cause some distraction and that distraction allows us to uh, engage in a little extra mobility. So really, really important, uh, again, strategy in order to facilitate um, flexibility, range of motion movements. So for example, we use that in your glenial humeral joint, um, something called a pendulum exercise uh, would be a good example of that. So sometimes people experience what's called a frozen shoulder. It means the, the capsule around the shoulder is restricted. Uh, so we create some distraction by simply just holding a moderately heavy weight and relaxing the shoulder completely and just allowing the arm to swing gently back and forth. Um, that creates some distraction and over time tends to loosen up that joint and facilitates greater range of motion. Um, it's the same kind of principle in terms of open pack, loose pack positions. Something that you guys can try for yourself is try and lift your arms overhead with your palms facing away from you. So put your arms to the side, um, turn your arms in as in ten, try to pronate them as much as possible so that the palms of your um, hand are facing backwards. Now try and lift your arms as high as you can possibly go and you'll feel it's quite difficult for you to do that, right? You're creating a, a closed back position. If you rotate them out, it's much easier to move your arms over your head. Okay, um, so that's just kind of putting it into uh, perspective. So conditions where loss of normal joints uh, play a significant role um, in terms of both pain and joint dysfunction uh, can be described in the following vicious cycle. So when a joint is not free to move, the muscles that are responsible for moving it cannot be free to move. When the muscles cannot be restored to their normal functioning, um, then the joint which they tend to move is not able to move, right? So it's a vicious cycle. So when the joint is restricted, the muscles are restricted. When muscles are restricted, the joint is restricted. So normal muscle function is therefore dependent on normal joint movement. That's one of the reasons why we emphasize flexibility and the ability to train it emphatically to make sure that you have normal range of motion present in all your joints. So when you uh, have impaired muscle function, uh, it tends to perpetuate and cause further deterioration in an already abnormal joint. Okay, so key here is to train flexibility and make sure that you have normal muscular function and joint function. Um, remember when your joint is restricted, simply training or doing flexibility 20 minutes a day is not going to be enough. You have to train flexibility for one hour, seven days a week for the next eight to 12 weeks in order to get a joint into normal ranges of motion. From there you can do a maintenance program, but the key fact is to train hard for flexibility to make sure that normal joint range of motion is uh, returned. So in summary, be able to identify differences between osteo and arthrokinematics. What are motions in different planes? Not only the physiological, but also the accessory motions. Uh, what role does goniometry play in, in terms of our understanding of range of motion? What do degrees of freedom refer to and how are these measured? be able to differentiate not only between open and closed pack positions, but also open and closed kinematic chains and identify what accessory motions are present from something like trunk to finger in order to facilitate uh, a greater amount of variation in our movement patterns. I think that brings our lecture to a close. Um, hopefully I've covered that well enough for you guys to understand it. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to drop me an email in the meantime um, and I'll try and answer it as best as I can. Um, otherwise, just kind of keep playing this video over and over until it makes sense. Cool. See you guys next time.